This is Podkit, episode 33, Prototypical Fun Stuff, on October 16th, 2017. And now, just for confusion, this episode of Podkit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersad, with show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk33. Hi, friends. Hey. Hello. How's it going? It's pretty good. Not too shabby. Right on. I think it's about time for another one of these things we call podcast. Yeah, it is. It's. I mean, it's been another month, so we're Truly. we're staying on schedule this time. I mean, this this quarter, I guess. I mean, it makes it really easy to sca- stay on schedule when it's once a month, <laughs> <laughs> mid month ish, plus or minus a few weeks. Truly, well, truly. yeah, we had a we had a gap from what was it like December to April? There was um, yeah, yeah. It was springtime, and we had to get out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We were celebrating the end of winter. Yeah, from, partway through. from January to April. <laughs> exactly. Yes. So we have uh, quite a few things to talk about today. Um, first one, breaking news from today. There was a WPA2 vulnerability that was released. Um, sure I believe enough. this is a collection of several CVEs from you know the standard 50-day release or uh, what is it, notice of of issue and public release. Mm-hmm. Um, now this, uh, kind of broke yesterday, Sunday on Twitter. And I saw a lot of, you know, people saying, Oh, it's going to be a, a, a fire of, of mess tomorrow, but it doesn't seem to be too bad. Um, I think Microsoft said the latest version of windows 10 already had it patched. Um, iOS and Mac OS versions already have fixes in the betas and it, mostly only affects Android and Linux implementations. Um, I think uh, if the manufacturer slash OS vendor uh, implemented it true to spec, it would have this issue. But like many good things in our world, it isn't always implemented to spec. And so some of these don't actually have that issue. Um, And so I think I was looking at some, some tweet and it looks like the the issue was you would be able to clone an access point, so the same SSID and things, and all other, I guess, um, public keys that they have. Um, they would break the encryption handshake and then override HTTPS with HTTP, and then you can man in the middle or steal or inject whatever you want. Right. So, yeah, 13 years of WPA2, and now we get a vulnerability. That's actually it's pretty good. Really yeah. cool. Um, you know, it, this this protocol has been out sitting around for, you know, a decade, and nobody's broken it this badly since. So, either the uh, NSA has known all along, or <laughs> they just found out. Yeah. Yeah. There's a there's a nice matrix of, you know, a list of the CVEs and then which um, operating system uh, <laughs> corresponds to their vulnerability uh, right. in this ours article. And I think that's pretty cool too. Yeah, I think uh, you know we'll see some some patches to do, but you know, like like a lot of Wi-Fi devices, most of most of the ones in in the world probably won't ever get updated. But it looks like if the you know if the client is updated, I think that's going to help a lot of the cases. So, what do you think the outlook of actually updating the actual routers would be? Like, how much how much hope do we have that that's actually ever going to happen? Um, a lot of these routers have at least places to update their firmware, but <laughs> but will anyone ever well, act, activate them? Yeah, that's the question. Whether it's yeah developed and released, and then how do you alert a user when the user probably doesn't even know that you can go to a router configuration page? It just right. works. There's the internet. You set it up once and you forget. So I mean, just just think about all of those uh, Comcast and CenturyLink routers too, just humming along in some closet. Yeah. Nobody even well, knows they are there. They could, they could alert when they man in the middle um, HTTP traffic or they proxy everything. Oh, yeah. They, so they, they, they love doing inject that. stuff into the web page. Because I think uh, Comcast does that at least. But that seems to be the only way I could think they would be able to alert it. But Yeah, that's, it's pretty unfortunate. I think it's worse to do that than <laughs> to send the, you know, or 
rather keep yeah. it unpatched WPA2 than inject stuff like that. So I mean, it's I, I guess I, I don't know of any routers other than like the Google router, which is called Google Wi-Fi, I think. That can solve, like that. that can auto patch and stuff, um, mm-hmm. and those ubiquity routers probably have a mode for that. Uh, yeah. so, and so I've I have a straight up access point which does not have an auto patch ability. Oh, that's too bad. But it it is pretty automatic. It is pretty automatic, despite the fact that you need to actually manually activate it. Now, if it's um, just an AP, does that mean it also does your routing, or do you have something else to do the routing? Nope, I have something else to do the routing. Okay, yeah. And I think Apple's, um, they flash if there's an update. They flash ah, orange. Um, that's right. Now, they don't make any new ones, but they're still supporting them. And then you can have the airport utility uh, open up and alert you when there is an update as well on your computer. So that's a little better than some of the things an ISP might give you. Oh, for sure, for sure. For sure. I was actually going to talk a little bit about the um, Ubiquity Networks update process. So um, Ubiquity Networks uh, access points have either a controller, uh, which is a piece of software that you run, uh, so not like on a phone or anything, or on the router, or sorry, on the access point, but like on another computer, uh, and that controller mm-hmm. may have some capability to automatically update, but um, I run it just from the mobile app, uh, and as a result, I... It, it doesn't have any capability to automatically update because there's nothing that's watching for those updates. Um, the AP is very, very slim, uh, and I believe was actually like uh, architected by a bunch of the folks who used to work at Apple designing network hardware. Hmm. Uh, but of course, Apple had uh, kind of no further uh, no further use for that when they. Uh, Which is funny. Yeah. Right. Right, and it's like a lot of those po- folks apparently ended up at Ubiquity Networks, which is good because yeah. Ubiquity Networks makes very good stuff. Yeah, because Ubiquity is is um, kind of meant to be like an enterprise, you know, business use. So the fact that they can have like a central update server makes sense for that. Yeah. Yep. And that 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 still remains on prem, right? It doesn't leave the. Yep. Uh, yeah, that's it's, quite important to some companies. Yeah, for sure, for sure. They make good stuff. They totally do. Uh, yeah. One of the best purchases I ever made probably has to be that uh, access point for sure. Yeah, I think that's one of the uh, one of those things I've always wanted to try. Those ubiquity products. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one day. One truly, day. truly. All right. I feel like. Um, we should move on to our next topic. Um, I think Brandon or Ryan no, you put this one it was, in No, it was I who did this. It was, it <laughs> was Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I wanted to talk about uh, your experiences with uh, DevOps stuff. Um, and that doesn't mean just like sitting there and, you know, deploying stuff to your own server, but like working with others to get your DevOps to work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, typically... You know what they'll say is you'll have, you know, some kind of some kind of testing, destined for some kind of continuous integration. So that could be unit testing, that could be functional testing, integration testing, whatever. Um, and there's different different things we can talk about that. Um, there's writing infrastructure as code, so codifying your infrastructure in a way that makes it sort of easy to reinflate in a future time. And I say sort of easy because it's not always actually easy. Yeah. Um, and then actually getting things deployed, um, not just to prod, but also to dev, to stage, and then to prod, um, in a way that makes everybody happy, especially the people who are um, trying to not let you do that. Yeah, mm-hmm. right? So what, what, what are your experiences? Yeah, one of the first things that I thought of when I saw this block in our topics uh, topics kind of section today is uh, a, a recent thing I ran into where I'm working with a couple of other folks on a initiative, and um, I kind of ended up working uh, predominantly on the kind of infrastructure layer, which is uh, 
which is pretty cool because uh, that meant that we got to test a lot of stuff out. Uh, first pass used a lot of Docker containers and in development we could use Docker Compose and that was great and it was awesome. But then I noticed we needed to have a registry uh, in order to really deploy that readily. So I looked at a couple ways that we might want to um, sort out getting a registry. And uh, the answer is uh, you kind of have a chicken and egg problem, right? Because in order to set up a registry, you either need to be willing to pay a company to manage it for you, or you need to be willing to set it up yourself and run it in Docker. Is that like a like a artifactory kind of registry you're talking about? Is yeah, this like so Docker Hub kind of thing. Kind of, yeah, exactly, exactly. So Artifactory does Docker in addition to a bunch of other things. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I actually considered Artifactory for a time. Uh, but ultimately, uh, there are one, maybe two, maybe three non-me people at, uh, on that team that would even remotely care about having something like Artifactory set up. And among those people they would all kind of position me as the person who would be maintaining it. Which of course. is not really a thing that makes like sense, right? Because fun, I brought right? the opportunity. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, like, I brought, I brought up the idea to those folks, and as a result, like, it's not unreasonable for them to think that, but simultaneously it's like, wait, and now you that doesn't it. really make any sense. Yeah, exactly. And as soon as that happened, I was basically just like, huh, uh, I guess I don't want to do that then. Uh, yeah. same sort of deal with Docker even, right? Because then, so <laughs> where do we end up? We have no registry, no place to put Docker images that we can otherwise like pull from when we deploy. Um, so what's our next step? Uh, our next step is moving away from Docker, which is, you know, kind of sad because Docker is great and building Docker images are a great way to kind of like adempotently um, and... Uh, individually handle deployments right so this commit hash goes into this build which creates this image which is deployed now um which is great but ultimately what i found is that like for that group and for what we actually need to do and for how um kind of the complexity of the project um we just kind of all settled on using something that would just allow us to receive a GitHub uh, uh, webhook and just trigger a build, right? Like on machine, check out the repo, trigger a build. That was it. That's kind of cool. Yeah, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I guess what I learned throughout this effort is basically that um, while it gave us the tools to try out a lot of fun stuff, which is cool, um, for the most part, DevOps... Uh, in the sense of like infrastructure as code or using Docker, Kubernetes or whatnot, only works if you have folks who care about also using those tools. Right. Um, yep. And folks who care about like setting a direction or maintenance for any of that, because that's not really a one person job. And it's not even a one person plus some occasional help from IT job. It's like a entire team decides on using this structure kind of thing. Exactly. So I, I, I guess I kind of covered a lot there. Um, and like, oh, another thing I forgot to mention about this entire initiative is that there are no tests to run, uh, no unit tests or anything like that. It's just very much a, a just kind of a for fun sort of thing. Code it's and deploy. It's like a, de a deploy only kind of experiment. Right. There's not really any need to run, to, to integrate. It's really ultimately just a deployment task. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, but what do you think, Brian? So I don't have I or there's a DevOps team at my work with just maybe ten people plus or minus, um, supporting a team of maybe six hundred developers. That's a lot. So yeah, they're they're very um, they're always busy. They have a ton on their backlog because they have a lot to do, um, a lot of a lot of people in different products to support. I think they have I don't know like seven or eight hundred products going through the pipeline, and you know they're. 2000 releases a week or something like that so there's a, a ton of movement going on so um it's been interesting seeing them evolve just in the year that i've been there so they switched from microsoft um release management studio which is horrible to octopus deploy which is much better and in the web um so instead of having to install a, a local client hitting a 
special Microsoft server, you can just load up a web page um, for managing your releases. Um, and that lets you, you know, this new tool lets you see more visibility as to what's going on, which I really like. So I can see exactly what the build steps are. So I can debug where something might be going wrong. Um, we also have Jenkins, both a continuous delivery and a pull request um, version of each product. So the pull request, of course, runs when you submit a pull request. And if that passes, then you can merge. Um, the continuous deployment triggers the dev build if something in development changes and an integration and production build if master changes. Um, I've quite liked that. Uh, I've kind of been, I think, on my team, one of the more or yeah, more active people to jump on to supporting DevOps and helping others kind of debug issues. Um, the the team is pretty good about supporting um, the developers and um, there's a huge DevOps t channel on our Slack team. So a lot of it's open for others to see. Um, and I'm seeing, I think, many or yeah, fewer and fewer errors that are kind of common things on the Slack channel just in the last 11 months that I've been there. So that's really nice to see. Um, this They kind of dump versions of a failed deploy to a directory and a file server. They also have kind of a red green deploy. So sorry, red, no green, green blue deploy. So it'll deploy to a, a second URL that you can hit to test something that said it failed to deploy. So like if acceptance or automatic automated acceptance tests fail, you can still hit that and see why something might be failing. That's really cool to be honest. That's yeah. Really I like cool. that too. Super nice. That. Yeah, and that was new through the Octopus Deploy. They are able to do that. So that's been really handy. And oftentimes that's because um, well, the last time we had a failed prod deploy was because two AATs failed. And that was just a, a fluke, I think, and some web service just a redeploy with the same code worked, which is a little... Who knows what, what actually happened. But um, So yeah, that kind of uh, passive deploy is quite nice. Um. And you can do things like run the accept or the end end tests from your local machine, but loading the external server, and you can kind of tweak things around and see what's actually going on. That's really cool, for sure, for sure. I guess one thing that I uh, didn't mention previously is that like um, Docker Compose has kind of been the extent of my infrastructure as code experience. But, That's not um, enough. Yeah, I mean, that's not really infrastructure as code, ultimately. It's, like, um, infrastructure abstraction as code, which is, like, related but distinct. Um, and so, like, uh, I guess I guess what I'm trying to say is, like, um, a lot of what I end up with is straight up uh, just deployment, continuous deployment instead of continuous integration. And, like, the idea of a green-blue environment is really... Uh, is really kind of awesome because generally speaking for me when quote unquote tests fail it's because a straight up deployment failed <laughs> and admittedly mm -hmm. that's mostly with personal stuff um but nonetheless like, yeah i guess so that's really like cool. i guess it sort of depends like the deployment failed because the test failed i guess maybe yeah yeah, yeah. that's fair yeah, so that's that's, fair. that's more my case and so i think in like a, a data warehousing team that I'm on, it's yeah. it's it's oftentimes when an acceptance an acceptance test fails, it's because we made an assumption about what data is in a lesser or an environment with near no data. Yeah. So we can only test stuff that actually has data that would only fill an applic parts of the application that would be loaded with data. So you know, it's sometimes we're trying to just work around other problems with yeah, that, for but sure. it at least helps us to do that. Um, and I will say there are some teams using, uh, doing some Node.js work, which are being deployed through Docker. I'm not sure. I think they're somewhat automated. I don't think there's a registry, though I could be wrong. Um, Artifactory or what's Mesosphere? That's another thing that sounds familiar too. It's, uh, it's one of those, uh, it's like Kubernetes, but different. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think some Mesosphere might be being used. I'm not really sure. I haven't touched it at all, but so there's some Docker work, um, at a few Linux hosts, but yeah, there's a, you know, a cluster of Jenkins servers and things and it works pretty well. Nice. Yeah. So I think it, I think it really depends on what your, 
what your team structure is like and what your product is like. So, yeah, that's and, and I guess what you're personally responsible for. So I do a lot of UI work right now and I find integration testing UI stuff to be horrible and uh, extremely frustrating. It um, takes so long to build <laughs> and install. And it's so a brittle. UI and, product, yeah. um, but I will say that if you actually have a, a dedicated person doing that continuous in, uh, that uh, th- those integration tests for continuous integration purposes, uh-huh. it is extraordinarily valuable um, to have. And especially as your product nears that you know one zero first release mark, mm-hmm. just having that makes everything so much better. You know those last few you know days commits whatever, um, and and I guess I also agree for things like on the server side automated integration testing for api layers that's pretty good oh, totally um i don't really i don't really get a whole lot out of unit testing front end code um and i and i get some out of unit testing back end code but it's not nearly as useful as do the pieces play well together because if they you'll you'll know if they don't if they just fail yep. at that level um but i guess i guess what i really want to uh, probe more into is the the infrastructure as code scenarios so where where i am we've actually we actually have um uh, you know we we deploy pretty much everything to aws right now and there's there's some work going on to abstract uh, that process so instead of just deploying through the aws console you know like you spin up an ec2 server and you you know, tell Drone or Jenkins or, you know, whatever you like to go and throw your Docker image up there. Um, instead of doing that, we have something more like Mesosphere or Kubernetes kind of um, orchestrating the containers by itself um, and abstracting that um, EC2 layer away from us, which is really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, and I um, over the weekend last week, I actually worked on a bunch of Terraform stuff and Terraform... Oh, right on is super cool on one side but also super horrible on the other so for example if you want to provision something like a i don't know like a domain name for example you can do that so if you already have a domain name established like ryanmr.com um you can actually um provision subdomains off of that in code and then check it in super cool but one of the frustrating problems with terraform is let's say you wanted to set up a CloudFront um, distribution for your, you know, website, whatever it is. Well, if you tie a C name or an A name to a CloudFront distribution, it will not be able to be run again unless that distribution is deleted first. So every time you want to make an update, you have to either run a down script from Terraform or go into the console yourself and delete it. And so there's there's a lot of weird little gotchas like that. And it's super cool to have code checked in like that, uh, or whatever whatever you call Terraform. It's not really code. It's more of like a YAML, YAML JSON HTML. Um, right, right. <laughs> um, it's really cool to have that kind of infrastructure as code. But when you have to spend um, more than a week to get it set up, it loses its value very quickly. So yeah. I guess I guess where I come down in all of this is all of it's super cool and very useful when it works well, and that when you have a plan and a pattern and um, as 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 you, both of you guys have said, as long as somebody actually cares about it to kind of champion the cause, um, but but as it gets out of control it quickly becomes a problem and sort of a blocker yep and i definitely know there you know there are cases when it's a blocker when there's things like um acceptance tests failed because of you know no data for that test in integration environment only like yeah you know it's going to work in production and so things like that that become okay now i have to like go fix this or write some exception for this environment, which you hope you don't have to do. Right. You know, little, little things in debugging it when you're pretty sure it's working in production or it will work in production. So it, it catches certain things, but it becomes an issue or uh, uh, 
a time sinker in other cases. You hope that doesn't happen, but so I'm I I you know you know we're all kind of fans of Marco Marco you know the mm-hmm. Marco Armand you know the guy the guy yeah totally um <laughs> and so his philosophy is eh tests who cares um and and I and I almost pretty much agree because if your if your code and or your deployment scenario is so complex that you can't remember how it works and you can't debug something easily you've already messed up. Yep. Doesn't matter how many tests you've written, you've already screwed yourself up. Uh, either that or your code has been completely decimated somehow. So I don't disagree that testing has its values, but at some point you have to be able to remember and rationalize your own code by yourself. Um, and I guess sort of for me, because I'm in this enterprise um, environment, we don't have that kind of luxury, but every time I see this thing happen, and it happens almost every time, where the CI, CD gets too big and then there's nobody to keep it going, um, I always think back to myself, oh, you know, if I was doing this in PHP, um, this wouldn't have been an issue because I would have just had a single server and it would have just worked <laughs> for the, you know, 20,000 users who would have ever needed to look at this thing. Right. So, it depends. No, I think absolutely. to... To warrant a full DevOps experience, you need either some big champions for it, um, self-service so you can configure it for your own stuff if you're interested, so something like Travis CI that you can just hook up and do on a repository basis that doesn't take a ton of work to support, um, or you know a large company where you have the resources and support from leadership to dedicate a team of people to support it. And uh, I think I'll, I'll add one more thing to that list. Yeah. Um, those are all excellent things. I love the self-service. It's a wonderful thing to have. You also need somebody to go to. You need that go-to champion who knows what to do in the exceptional case. So yeah, something that you can't put into Drone or Jenkins or Travis easily. Something else. Mm-hmm. Next up is uh, Node WebKit, which is a tool that I've been using rather frequently here. Um, mostly for fun. Uh, but one of the things that's really great that I didn't quite realize about Node WebKit just because of my uh, kind of recent experience with React over the past couple of years um, is that uh, Node WebKit is not just a tool that you might use to build a app with web technologies on the desktop. It actually literally has a full-blown shared execution environment for Node.js and browser um, JavaScript. So you can update the DOM and you can also make calls to the file system, which is Mm. bonkers, right? Like I never realized that that was like the main thing about Node WebKit. So what's the difference between this and like Electron? Um, So Electron requires kind of two separate execution environments for Node.js and um, browser layer JavaScript or quote-unquote browser layer, I believe. I could be wrong. It's possible somebody has a demo to the other, uh, to to the contrary. But as far as I can understand, Node WebKit is the only thing of its sort where you can literally in the same file have an express server and also, without serving it, write client-side JavaScript in the same file. Hmm. So like you can write... um, a React component uh, that is rendered every time you hit that JavaScript file, right? Uh, and that can be the export of the module. But you can also run an Express server along with it. Well, that's pretty cool. Uh, hmm. Right? And it's like, why would you ever need this? Um, for a very large amount of, like, prototypical fun stuff. But, right, like, when I when I ran into this, when my friend showed me this, I was just, like, um, blown away. Because it seems like one shouldn't be able to do this sort of thing, right? Um, it seems like something that is kind of practically improbable. But, you know, none, nonetheless it happens. And, you know, you combine this with stuff like Webpack and Babel. And you have, like, what is a really powerful platform for our kind of cross-platform desktop apps. Um, I'm, I'm super psyched by it. Uh, and which is kind of surprising because like I remember looking at Node WebKit three, four, five years ago almost, um, 
and just being kind of uh you know cool with it but now that i know about this kind of uh shared environment to execute code that calls node.js apis and browser apis um i'm kind of a fan <laughs> right i wonder how this will play in the future with you know um JavaScript modules, because I know there's some fragmentation between how Webpack handles it and how Node is going to handle it. Oh my yeah. gosh, it's a horrible, Which horrible is, thing that's happened in our industry. A brief Absolutely. summary is, Node wants to use .mjs files, and the browser doesn't. That's how I understand it, essentially, in one sentence. But, um, I wonder how this will, you know, play into that in the future of, if you're going to be trying to get your clo- code closer together and not use things like Webpack and um, Babel, you know, if yes, 2016 or 2017 is, is good enough for what you need, can you release something both front and back end in a very similar environment without needing to polyfill everything? Right. It's kind of not super related, but maybe. <laughs> no, I feel that. I feel that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And like what I've seen Node Web get used for most frequently are things like, um, uh, kind of uh, independent apps, kind of smaller scale. Um, I've actually uh, was a subscriber to a Node WebKit app that kind of helped to catalog every like article, um, blog entry, you know, page you've ever hit in a web browser uh, that allows you to look back at, at it. It was super helpful when I was working on my thesis last year. Um, but that was a Node WebKit app. Do you load one of these in a browser or do you load it in a special desktop application? Yeah, so it's like an executable. It's literally like a okay. desktop oh, yeah. application okay. yeah, executable. Yep. Yeah, I okay. just downloaded it and it's uh, I don't know what to do with it now. And appa- I saw apparently Node WebKit is a is an old name. Now they want to be NWJS. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, so it really should... shouldn't have even been called WebKit, you know, but you know, whatever. It should be Nobody's... NC for <laughs> Node Chromium. Nobody's nobody's keeping track of that. Right. It was yeah. back when Node Web when Chromium was based on WebKit that Oh it you was know, Node back WebKit. in well, those old days. It's still based Throwback. on it. It's just <laughs> it's been a while, yeah. And it's right, just right. forked. Yeah. Just like WebKit is really just KHTML. Exactly. <laughs> to its core all the way. Oh man. For real. For real. Well, that's about all I have to say about that. I hear that there's a new phone over in the Google sphere, though. There is a new phone, and I might have purchased it. Oh, man, Maybe. really? Are you getting yours on October 19th? No, you're not. I see that here. <laughs> October 27th or 28th? Yeah, it's one that of those two days. You know how the post school. office is. Um, Truly. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, the, what was it? The Made by Google event was actually hosted by Google, it wasn't just a blog post, which is rare. Um, hmm. And, um, you know, of course, I was in a meeting during the event, and so I didn't actually get to see it. But then when I came back from my meeting, I uh, just opened a new tab because I had to Google something, and I saw new phones by Google, and I'm like, oh, that was today? <laughs> <laughs> um, and of course, I knew it was that day, but I didn't remember. And I knew that because... I had a show on the calendar for Ian and I to record about that mm-hmm. very event. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, you can tell I'm doing a really good job at uh, keeping up on the tech news there. So the phone I purchased was the Pixel 2 XL for the very low price of $911.67. Wow. Uh, just I, I mean, I feel that my you... iPhone 7 was a solid percentage of that. So yeah, like same. like eight eighty percent. So like eight hundred dollars. Yeah, eighty eight percent, maybe something like that. Yeah, close enough. So I, I I don't know. Like you know, nobody needs to make these phones this expensive, but somebody's doing it. Um, Ian and I talked on that episode about how the the high end has become the mid mid range, and there's yeah. just a new high end now. <laughs> um, and it's and it's really terrible, and I don't. And in, your, in, in, in this particular phone, you're not really getting um, any of the, the quality of life you would get on a higher high end. So, like, if you if you were to purchase, like, a Note 8, 
you would actually be getting an additional S Pen. You'd be actually getting an additional camera. You'd be getting additional, well, not battery life. You'd, you'd, be, you'd be getting <laughs> less explosions. So, you, you do get better stuff when you do pay more. Um, like if you compare the um, iPhone 8 and the uh, X, you'll get a better screen with the X. I mean, that's not something anybody is disputing. It just is true. So, you do get more when you do pay more. And it's just unfortunate that you have to pay $400 more than what used to be considered expensive. Mm-hmm. I feel that um, for sure. So I'm getting mine uh, in a few weeks. So a couple weeks from now. And it'll be fun to play with. Um, I think... Um, so we're actually having a uh, Halloween hackathon at work at the office. Nice. And, Ooh, fun. And, and, and so I'm going to get another tripod... So I'll have both pixels doing a time lapse of our hackathon. Ha, from a two, awesome. two angle thing. Yeah, two angles. I I probably could actually order two, and then all three phones could be recording. It's like I probably won't need my phone just, during that. Just whole order day. another pixel too. Yeah, just totally <laughs> just do that, huh? Um, so I think it's really cool. Uh, Ian and I talked at length about it. Um, you can listen to NS fifty six, I believe, is the number. Um, and you can read all about the wonderful other things that happened um, that day also. Um, funny story, as I mentioned earlier, that I didn't actually watch the presentation before I ordered the phone. I literally waited <laughs> 10 minutes, and it's like, eh, I'll just order it. Why not? I think uh, I, I saw you talk to Ian about that on Slack, and I didn't see till after the fact. Yeah. And you're like, I'm like, how much time actually went there? Like, yeah, 10 minutes. Yeah, okay. it was 10 minutes. Um So, uh, when I ordered, I didn't know that you actually would get a free, what is it called? Google Home Mini? I had no idea. And then I was pleasantly surprised by the fact that I would, in fact, get one. So, that's, it was pretty cool. For real? I heard that the the buttons on the Google Home Mini don't actually do anything anymore on the top. Apparently, the 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 Google Home Mini had some issues. Um, So, at first, it was just randomly listening to people. Even though you hadn't right. said, okay, Google. Um, and and so when I get my home mini in a few months or weeks or whatever, um, it'll be right here in the in the room with me. And so when I say, okay, Google, you'll hear it plunk. Um, but, but I yeah, think so they, it, was they, like, it was like a hardware issue. So yeah. they're just disabling it now for the rest Forever. of the life. Yeah, yeah. It, it's really bizarre. And I feel like Google might have dropped the pill-shaped ball. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um hopefully those kinds of hardware defects can be like fixed in like a rev 2 like maybe they made uh, I don't know 100,000 units for this initial shipment and maybe right. in the next wave they can just fix it. Yeah. One would hope. Yeah, definitely. One um, would. All right. Well, uh, next up, I I thought we could do a little follow up for uh, USB C. Oh, that's Armin. always fun. Of course, yeah. Following up on uh, what Nexus special version, or it was it? No, it was a TED, wasn't it? I don't watch TV. <laughs> uh, I will uh, put a link in the show notes. Um, but it's just kind of saying all of the the issues with USB C, um, kind of centered around Apple, of course because it's Marco, but, um, you know, just the, the fragmentation across USB-C and Thunderbolt and the different types of data you can put over it, the different types of, or different wattage of power, different types of cables that can support power or data or lower data, no power, you know, it's all over the place. The only thing that's this common is the connector is the same. And the connector is not the standard for the most part. That's yeah, my summary. Well, I have and yeah. That's a really strong summary. And I think like one of the things that's so frightening about this too is as you mentioned, that like various cables can look identical and particularly identical to people who aren't aware of like anything other than the USB port that you plug into your computer, right? Or that you use to charge yeah. your phone. Um but they can vary widely and wildly and um there are numerous configurations, as Marco speaks about in the article, um, where you can fry a phone or fry a laptop um, or fry the cable you used to charge a laptop, right? 
by just yeah. mixing up one or two physically compatible parts that are not um, uh, compatible in their capability to deliver power or deliver data or both. It's like it's several different standards that just lose the safety of the port being a different size or a different shape. Right, exactly, which feels like kind of one of the core things about designing a connector or port. (laughs) Yeah. Right? And I really like like the the idea that... Yeah. I really like the idea of, you know, USB-C as a standard, but if it's going to be compatible with everything, every single cable made needs to support 100 watts, which means it's going to be giant and expensive. And, you know, you can't go longer than three or six feet, I think. It's three feet, right. maybe, even for for 100 watts. So, and that's just not realistic for, you know, a bunch of smartphones that only going to use, you know, 15 watts of power. Uh-huh. So. And then, yeah. you know, you have backwards compatibility with, like, Qualcomm Quick Charge versus USB-C power delivery. Um, that was something Marco mentioned in the in the note. Um, mm-hmm. And then just general confusion that I think we've discussed between Thunderbolt three and USB C, as well. So what 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 can who can fix this? Like what can we do to fix it? Not we as in us, but like what can the industry do? Yeah, I think like what what it starts with for, from my perspective is changing the connector shape, which I know sounds blasphemous, but like um, first things first is that these cables already aren't compatible, so they've made their bed right um, in order to be. Uh, in order to like protect users from situations that could fry their electronics and possibly damage uh, property and hurt them, uh, I think the first thing they need to do is um, specify a higher wattage and a lower wattage cable and make uh, those two classes uh, kind of uh, visually and physically distinct such that you can't... Uh, fry things or hurt people (laughs) yeah i think so they've already shipped things for a couple of years now so i think it's almost too late for that you know otherwise you're gonna have extreme fragmentation i think moving forward what you can do is color code connectors for low power high power and things like maybe you have three a medium power so low power is rated up to 15 watts that'd be all smartphones and things you know medium power be you know, yellow or something, and you that go up to I don't know thirty watts, and then you have high power, which is up to hundred or something. You could even have super high if, if you know, ninety watts is all you really need, I guess. But, and so I think then you can kind of color code saying this port's compatible up to this, and they kind of you know if it's higher, it supports the lower one. I don't know. That could be a solution, though. That's kind of gross too. That's confusing, and you have to do color codes, and that's not really accessible to certain you know people have colorblindness and so maybe have shapes or i don't know but then then it's basically four different standards that are yeah. all kind of the same thing anyway yeah it's a really tough thing and and so i'm reading marco's uh post here um so he says about the future so we'll have a new faster usb4 and a new faster thunderbolt 4 and they'll both be over USB C. then we'll want to switch to an even thinner USB D kind of port and then we'll call it the future. Yep. Sounds so, like uh, what we have right now. Yeah. Well, what they say here on this network is whatever old is new again. <laughs> so really. I, I, I feel like, you know, some of this, like like you both said, like the color coding, we've tried that before. People still didn't get it. And, and, and even if people didn't get it, which is excusable because nobody teaches people anything, manufacturers <laughs> didn't even get it. Right. So they would not make they would intentionally choose not to make all of the ports on a computer usb3 or 3.1 or whatever they would intentionally choose to um put usb c on one side of the computer but usb shaped holes with thunderbolt on the other side of the computer um they would intentionally ship computers with one usb c port so well i think that's a cost saving measure it is but it's also intentional and it hurts people and the actual cost difference is dollars and not hundreds. Yep. So Well, across ten thousand, fifty thousand computers, that's saving money. And I think, you know, there if there if there aren't rules and you know, standards in the spec that you can't I mean you couldn't really like force them to put two ports on or no ports, but um 
you know, there's, there's no real way to enforce that. So one and of the problems with Thunderbolt adaption was that Intel kept it um, secretive for too long um, in the in the licensing agreement. So you had to pay pay Intel to actually implement Thunderbolt, and a lot of lower cost machines just wouldn't bother, you know, shortening the margin by adding Thunderbolt. But if like Thunderbolt is clearly a better cable and a better standard for data transfer. So it could have been adopted much faster. The same thing happened to USB 3. It was more expensive to implement physically. There was no licensing issue there, but it was still physically more complicated than people at the time, vendors at the time, were capable of producing. Um, so you need to make a standard also aware of the industry's practice. Like, be super cheap as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. Uh, maybe in another 25 years now, never mind. I think it'll I think, all just be wireless then. And I think, you know, a lot of this will kind of even out over time too. And I think what we'll probably see is a lot of devices will have US if they have USB C, they won't support super high power. You it you won't charge your laptop through there, it's just another port. And I feel, you know, only the high end stuff or or MacBooks are gonna actually charge through it. Just for confusion and safety like that. Um just for confusion. Well, I mean, it's probably more expensive to do that. You need to add yet another port that's pretty much only dedicated for charging. I think there are, there are you know, devices out there that only charge through one of the USB-C ports. And so... On the other hand, Apple had the best charging connector known to humans. Yep. But yep. I think, you know, they're, they're pushing for the standard. And so I think, yeah, you know, they courage they took they had the courage to <laughs> to you know push for the standard and go all in and putting four usb type c or thunderbolt 3 ports on a laptop and nothing else other than an audio output that's that's pretty bold and i don't think many other companies are going to do that so this this the spec kind of needs to be designed for the common case however i think apple is going to be a huge push of whatever new spec that comes out because um, they they are the ones who really are gonna say this is worth putting in a laptop. We'll we'll pay this license fee, like it's nothing. Let's let's do it. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Um, Thunderbolt going forward, at least next year, will be royalty free. So we'll see. Okay. Yeah. It'd be nice to see in more and more devices. For sure. I and you know like another reason why I've been. Uh, kind of a little bit silent in this regard is because the only USB Type C device I own is one that I bought from Ryan. Um, oh, hey, that which one. is uh, yeah, 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 the Nexus Six P, which is still the um, possibly the most uh, valuable uh, device I own in that it connects me to uh, Android, <laughs> yep. which uh, helps me squash lots of subtle bugs and make lots of people happy. So uh, that is perpetually appreciated. No problem. Uh, anyhow, it is time for uh, America's favorite segment here, which is uh, our new Twitter followees. Uh, strikingly, alarmingly, I have no new Twitter followees since we that's last That's impossible. Spoke. You didn't follow anyone in the last month? Well, that's well, because he followed quite. 2,000 people in the last year. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not that I didn't follow anybody. It's just that I didn't follow anybody applicable. I did have one account here that I was going to share with you all. But uh, then I looked a little bit further down list, and it turned out Brian also had that account. So uh, I'm going to uh, you can steal defer it from to me. you all on this one. No, it's all good. You should go all right. for it. It's too good. So it's too good. I'll start with that account, and that would be the at get lost account. Um, so this is an account uh, named Developer Swearing. So it's a, a bot... Um, who is it run by? Some some guy who goes by at U that is amazing. I -R -I this is incredible. Zero. So I saw this retweeted a bunch uh, a few, I don't know, like a week ago maybe. Um, and so it's just like commit messages that have swearing in it. So it's things like your standard swear words as well as things like uh, sucks. I've seen come up a bit too. And so some sometimes it's... Um, part part of a word so their their regular expression they use to build this isn't like perfect in some cases i think it's maybe they're good they're working on it 
but it's just an amusing chuckle to see what people are talking about. And there are a few a few ones that I've liked and retweeted since. I'm gonna I'm gonna find one from a week ago that I just loved. You know, the internet loves to bash on uh, node modules, so this tweet is added node modules to avoid having to rebuild this uh, sh- this shit heap. So it's <laughs> and that's. Uh, sums it up pretty well there are some very good tweets here this is probably one of my favorite accounts i've missed many of them because they tweet awfully frequently um they do and this is just amazing it's a little more frequent than i would maybe like but at the same time it it allows for more tweets to come through so you know it would be really bad if they actually linked back to the actual commit oh that would be horrible (laughs) oh my gosh (laughs) yeah uh, my other two Twitter accounts are not related to tech at all. So one is Bobby Raps. This is a uh, a guy who went to my high school who's a, a, a rapper. I don't know. I finally follow him on Twitter. He's cool. He's got, he put an album out called Mark a couple months ago. That video um, has pretty good production values, so that's all I know. Yeah. Um, and another guy who I think went to Highland High School did the intro edit for that, who I used to know a little bit so it's been kind of cool seeing and i had a couple classes with this guy he's i think your age ryan you're over me so cool. that's kind of cool to see um and then there's uh the other the classic the one the only at age of empires so age of empires 4 is coming out sometime probably next year or the year after and they're releasing age of empires definitive edition which is kind of a remake of the existing age of empires games with 4k textures and some improved engine and um well that sounds like fun so it was supposed to come out this last weekend but they delayed it because they didn't think it was quite up to snuff so it'll probably be released early next year and i'm super excited to buy it because i love age of empires i signed up to try to be on their closed beta but we'll see if i am in or not i was on their beta for age of empires online back in 2011 2009 I think 2009, and it was kind of a bad game. I hardly played it at all. But So, uh, leading up to Age of Empires 4, which I cannot wait for. Nice. Anyway, nice. what about you, Ryan? Well, I don't... I, I, I might have followed new people, but I have no way to know. But, more importantly, it was my dog, Roxy's birthday a few weeks ago. So I had to take this picture I tweeted of her on her birthday and embed it in here. Oh, happy birthday, so Roxy. Yeah, happy birthday, Roxy. Well, what a pal. She likes pillows. Yeah, she's Truly. so good. Truly. Who among us does not? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. So what's uh, what's coming up in the next, uh, I don't know, entire month? <laughs> um, oh, man. I will be at JavaScript Minnesota next week. That's so already know. next week. That's amazing. Next week, yes. <laughs> it was next week last month too, but uh, a <laughs> different next week. <laughs> yeah, uh, I actually may or may not be there this week. Uh, next week, uh, I should be, I think, but uh, we shall see. Uh, I uh, oh, I launched a thing. Um, I think I told you all about it. Um, I it, it was very cool. I have no idea why that didn't come up uh, earlier on, but uh, I launched a project with uh, uh, a bunch of my coworkers out into the world, and it's really cool. We got a lot of good feedback, and that was cool. So this month is going to be a lot of that. Um, what is the remaining thing? I'm going to try to relaunch my personal website. Uh, I'm going to use yeah, yeah. Uh, Resumus, the platform that friend of the show, Max Fierke, uh designed and built. Uh, it's recently refactored into an API uh, platform that you can use to f- base your uh, personal site uh, or JSON resume uh, kind of front end on. So it serves as a JSON resume back end, uh, but you can simultaneously just like build a front end on top of it. Um, cool. I'm Ooh, going to. I want to check that out. Do with that. Yeah, it is very cool. Very cool. Uh, so I built a skeleton front end to it here. Um, that's kind of still in progress. It is on the GitHub at Skyline Project slash Resumus dash L, which is what I just typed as I said it. 
link going in the show notes now-ish. Cool. Also, it's written in Elm, which is exceedingly cool. <laughs> oh, you and your Elm. Elm is amazing. How about you, Brian? What, what do you got coming up there, Ryan? Wait, me or wait? Did I go? I don't remember. <laughs> I, I I don't know if you went or not. I'm sorry. Yeah, you said you said JavaScript Minnesota. Oh, I said but... JavaScript Minnesota. Well, uh, so the reason that was very confusing is because you broke out twice. Whenever you said <laughs> either of our names, we still don't know. We heard. Oh no. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, um, I've been uh, every weekend since many weekends ago been uh trying to wait and find out when uh gatsby would be ready for actual use um Uh, yes and finally this weekend they actually uh updated their yaml plugin to produce something that's sort of sensible i'm not quite convinced that i like the uh extraordinarily in-depth uh graphql integration Mm-hmm. So we'll see if I actually end up using it or not. Um, like I think I think Gatsby is super cool, but maybe I just need to wait for like 2.0 because maybe maybe 1.0 is just not quite sharp enough yet. Right. Um, and then um, you know between uh, now and the next time we do this, most likely, um, uh, doing a lot of stuff at work for getting uh, something out the door for a very uh popular um time of year and um it's pretty cool we're we've made a huge amount of progress and it's gonna go gonna go in just a few days here and it's gonna be used throughout this very popular time of the year nice that's awesome congrats dude that's great yeah that's fun uh i guess what i've kind of been up to i was i've been participating in hectoberfest which is a uh, a uh, project put on by DigitalOcean and GitHub to encourage um, contributions to open source software. Right on. So their goal is four pull requests in the month of October. So it's not too late to start. Um, and then I think you get some stickers and a shirt. You get stickers either way if you sign up. You get a shirt if you complete four pull requests or submit. I think you just have to submit them. So I added a couple things to D3 time format. So that was merged in. So that was cool. I am a contributor of D3. Um, and I've just helped around some other things, um, a couple other simple, uh, websites that are on GitHub that I tweak some styling or something for. That's extremely so, cool. I've signed up for that, but someone, I haven't, yeah. I haven't, uh, completed it any so far. I've had a bunch of stuff that I've like looked into, but people have been like, one of the, one of the really awesome things about Hacktoberfest is how many people just like straight up will, uh, dive into a thing and resolve it very quickly. However, I... You gotta claim it in that issue. Yeah, exactly. Um, I don't usually have the focus to do such things uh, immediately the time I discover them. So even when I like set th- something aside in a tab and I'm like, I'm gonna get to that when I have more time, uh, it, it never happens. So I guess that just means that um, uh, Hacktoberfest, while cool, might not be the best match for my uh, work pattern. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I have the same problem too. I, I, I use all my focus up at work, and then by the time I'm done, it's like, what was I doing again? What day yep. is it? Who am I? Yep. I was up till exactly like three a.m. on a Friday doing my D three stuff, and um, there were some issues with that code that I probably should have <laughs> noticed. There was like a there was a commit on top of a lot of the stuff I did saying like style changes, but oh well. Should use a few things I picked up like <laughs> yeah. Well, there, there, the D three time format library has an ESLint configuration, but it has issues with it in oh. the repository. Yeah. So that wasn't and and there should be more rules like re- requiring um, quotation marks instead of an apostrophe. Yeah. around things and i prefer apostrophe so i was writing apostrophe in some places but not all the places because i was trying to match but i didn't i didn't like give it a, a triple look over before committing it all oh well it worked though so that was what was important truly that's awesome so yeah 
All right. Well, where can we find you all on the internet? Well, you can find me just about anywhere, uh, except for at Brandon.mn, which is a website that's willfully out of date and mostly links to Instagram, which reminds me, if you want to find me at uh, on Instagram, uh, you can go to Instagram.com slash Brandon underscore MN. That's Brandon with an A first and then an O, uh, no E whatsoever. How about you, Brian? Uh, you can find me on the internet at my website, BrianM.me, which I just updated the homepage a little bit it now has emoji kind of matches nice. my twitter bio and i put more flexbox in and took out some like float grid stuff um and then you can also find me on twitter at brian mitch l where i am most active on the internet what about you ryan and of course you can find me just about everywhere but especially on the twitter and ryan Amar, and of course on my website ryan very nice all right. Well, until next month, have a good one. Have a good yeah, one. Take care, friends. Bye.